oh, you're the first Muslim woman I've ever spoken to. This idea that you've never spoken to a Muslim woman when one in eight people on this planet is a Muslim woman is quite beyond me. I mean, like, where are you living? Taking center stage is Sarah Joseph OBE. Sarah is an influential powerhouse in Muslim media, who is the founder, editor, and CEO of ML Media, a platform that has created a shift in the way Muslims are portrayed and marketed to. So who better to talk about the representation of Muslim women in mainstream media than the woman who is listed as one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world, and who has lectured on Islam globally for over two decades. ML Media is the first of its kind. So can you just take us back to how it all started and what was that spark? And I, I'd been in media for a long time. I had, from university, uh, from an undergraduate university, I would, began doing lectures. I was, you know, lecturing all over the country. I did radio and I started with TV. And so I guess you'd call it a quote unquote public profile. Um, and then in 2001, I'd had, I had my baby. She was three weeks old. Um, and the terrible events of 9-11 happened. And I spent a year, um, I had two other children. Uh, they were six and uh, two and uh, this newborn baby. And I spent a year of my life, um, CNN, BBC, Sky News, uh, church halls, civic halls, town halls, uh, all sorts of platforms saying we're anti-violence, anti-extremism, anti-terrorism. And literally, baby would be strapped to me half the time, kids in tow, this this mad life of exchanging these children with my with my husband on the you know just trying to to get through and after a year of doing that i mean i was physically emotionally and spiritually exhausted and it was this sense that i can't keep saying what we're against i can't keep saying oh, here is this horrendous thing that i had nothing to do with that isn't fundamentally repugnant and and you're constantly on the defense. And constantly saying, I'm against this. Hmm. And we had to, I had to say, well, what are we for? What is Islam for? You know, when we look at the names of God, the beautiful names of, of justice, of beauty, compassion, mercy, kindness. And how do we reflect that? What does a contemporary Muslim lifestyle reflect? What is, what is important to us? And so we launched a Mel magazine, and it's derived from the letter M and the letter L, meaning Muslim life. Um, but it also has deep roots in the Arabic and Turkish language, meaning your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations. So we created this new word that was fundamentally about what we were trying to do. What are our dreams, hopes and aspirations? And we were able to articulate and bring to the forefront and tell the stories of Muslims. Well, as the, the main face of the ML brand, how did you find navigating in the publishing sector, especially as a, as a Muslim woman? It was always tricky because I'd give someone a magazine, as often, you know, quite high profile people. And I remember one comment, they'd be like, it's like an ordinary magazine. And I'd be like, well, what did you think yeah. it was going to look like? You know, what would it look like to you? Um, but the fact that it had gardening and travel and food and fashion and faith and politics, it covered every every aspect of life because Muslims are engaged in every aspect of life. Um, and I think it was that humanizing element that really shocked people. But people thought that it was, um, they were shocked, I guess, by its quality because the production values were really high. And as a Muslim woman, I suppose they weren't expecting that, that, that comment often of, oh, you're the first Muslim woman I've ever spoken to. Like, okay, talk to me about that. What do you mean? You're the first Muslim woman I've spoken to are we just talking about in the media sector here like no you know I mean obviously I'd go to events all sorts of events and you'd meet very well to do very well educated people who would come and sort of talk to you and be shocked be shocked by the fact that I speak English before be shocked by the fact that I speak English with a, a sort of Kensington accent and they'd be like well I don't know they, they're so taken aback because it, I, I guess it's such a disconnect with what they perceive as Muslims, as what they perceive as a Muslim woman. And this idea that you've never spoken to a Muslim woman when one in eight people on this planet is a Muslim woman is quite beyond me. Mm. I mean, like, where are you living? Well, the magazine was going for 10 years, but you've been in the media for a lot longer. 
When it comes to representation of Muslim women in mainstream media, have you seen a positive shift? Has there been more spaces for Muslim women just to be? I think there's definitely some positives, singular examples which come along from time to time, but they're almost notable by their exception. I don't think... By their excellence. By their excellence, for sure, but but they stand out because it's not the norm to see it. If there were lots of Muslim women in the media, you know, where you just felt, oh, wow, you know, we're just, it's there because it's, we're there as the norm. We're, we're a long way from that, but there are examples here and there. Yeah. So what needs to change in your opinion? How do you get the stories of Muslim women out there in the mainstream media? I think we have to understand the, the tropes and the caricatures. We have to understand what drives those, right? That Muslim women are oppressed and they're perceived as oppressed. Muslim women are, um, you know, they have to be liberated. They have to be liberated from the veil. And so this idea that Muslim women are oppressed by Islam, what is what is going on there? How do we unpick that? Um, and then the homogeneity of Muslim women, that, you know, they're, they're this sort of singular identity. At the end of the day, there's 8 billion, give or take, people in the world. Uh, give or take two billion of them are Muslims. So that's like one in eight people on this planet is a Muslim woman. That's a lot of diversity, but yet we're boxed into this trope of oppressed, abused, need to be liberated, or the the kind of fantasy of Muslim women. Um, you know, the veiled in mystery, the, the, the Arabian nights, the exoticized, the oriental, the image that came around through colonialism. Um, as a convert, often, you know, the convert story is, oh, that's that's interesting uniqueness. And exotic. Exotic. Again, it's always exotic. It's mm. always other. Mm. And now we're also seeing the trope and the caricature of Muslim women as extremists because they've kind of done the men's story. So now you have dramas in the UK where, you know, the whodunit dramas of the incident and, and the big reveal is actually the Muslim woman. Um, so we have to be cautious and understand and, and question and then ask, why are these, where is this coming from? You know, why is the media focusing on these these caricatures, these Why tropes? do you think they're focusing on those caricatures? It fulfills the purpose of Islamophobia in, in many descriptions without being paranoid about it. But it's just that othering of some of someone else to other. Um, it's a, a historic uh, a, a thing that happens, um, whether it, you know, once upon a time, you know, it was different communities over time that has always been othered. And I think that the Muslims are having our turn as being othered. Um and in relation to Muslim women, I think that we, that kind of homo- homogenizing is really difficult and really dangerous. And so what do, your, your, your question was, what do we do? I think we've got to, first of all, understand what's happening. And then we need to project other images, other voices, and understand them ourselves and articulate our own narratives, our own messages. I think that's really, really important. And then we need to make sure that there are pathways, pathways that people can access the media. The media is a, and I'm talking the media, is it, a very, it's, it's a huge, huge thing. It's huge. It's know, very vast. It, yeah. It's a multi-billion dollar industry yeah. across the globe, you know. Um, but how do we get people trained in the competencies of the media, whether that be writing or storytelling? I, I think storytelling is really important. The, the capacity to tell your own story yeah. um, that engages wide and popular audiences, that it's, an, it's, it's a human story. Um, it's not just a, a singular Muslim story. We're telling human stories. Actually, just remembering that, a Muslim woman is, is, is you know, let's humanize her um, and, and recognize her place in the world but to be able to want to sort of see some reflection of ourselves Mm. um i think that's it that is a yearning that you want to make sure that our kids have dolls that look like them and represent them and feel them i mean in relation to the judgment of scarf or no scarf i get it you know this this actual obsession with policing and politicizing women's bodies is so fundamentally frustrating to to everybody, I think, because, I mean, look, I wear, I wear a white scarf, 
bright. I always wear white because any other color just irritates me. I, I, my, my family, I came from, my mother was one of the world's top model agents. Can you imagine rocking up looking like this? It didn't please anybody, right, in my family. God bless them. It took them a long time to get acceptance, but they preferred it if I wore white. Now I can only wear white. Um, and so, but look, we're looking at a meter square piece of white cotton, but yet you'd think it was the most important thing about in the world or about me. And so we have these these political narratives where you can have Boris Johnson, who became the the you know the prime minister, who's calling Nikabi women uh, letterboxes and and bank robbers. And when he gets pushed to, uh, and it, you have an independent inquiry for the Tory party, they exonerate him completely, saying he has a right to these freedoms of speech. And everyone's got an opinion, particularly such a, a sort of righteous opinion. And you're like, hold on, he's comparing them to criminals. How dare you? How dare you be so humiliating in your approach and so disrespectful to a woman's fundamental right to choose how she dresses? So I get it. There's lots of our feelings like, you know, well, am I, an, I, I, don't, I don't wear the scarf, but I'm judged by Muslim women who, who do. And, you know, well, I do wear the scarf and I'm judged by people who don't. Like, stop the judgment and stop deciding or prejudicing the experience of people just because of what someone chooses to wear. You, you can't wear a, a, um, a swimsuit, an all-in-one swimsuit on a beach in France. I don't understand that. Why are you so... I don't think a lot of people can understand that. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Why are you so obsessed with what I'm wearing? Just get over it. Let me get on. Let's, let's talk and communicate about ideas. Let me be a positive force for common good in the world, you know, between me and you. Let, let me talk about the issues. Let's talk about the things that I care about. Let's talk about climate change because that's going to be a huge problem. You know, let's not talk about my scarf. It's really not interesting. I'm interested to know how little Sarah, young Sarah, whose mother was this powerhouse, this formidable and classy woman in the world of, of modeling. And she, she was a successful, she owned a successful modeling agency. How did that young Sarah become the Sarah that we see today? I had prejudices towards Muslims, towards Islam. Prejudices, my mum would always tell me, thou shalt not be prejudiced was her number one rule. Um, and those prejudices were, were, were drawn of born, born of ignorance, you know, and the ignorance creates fear. So I knew I had to get rid of the ignorance in order to get rid of the fear, in order to get rid of the prejudice. Because I didn't want to be prejudiced. And that journey led me to, to go, wow, they believe in God. That sounds ridiculous, but they believe in God. They believe in one God. They believe in Jesus. They believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, you know, and the whole story and you, you, your eyes get opened. And I became a Muslim. And, and you were 16? I was 16. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand I was a very religious 16 year old. So it was hard for my family, though. Mm. And I get it. I get it. It was hard. It took me a long time to realize. But they were grieving. I think that in the beginning, they were grieving that the Sarah they thought I was or going to be, the Sarah they thought I was going to be, they, they suddenly thought, oh, no, it's... It's disappeared. It's not our little girl. You know, the opportunities are going to be curtailed. Um, and that was, that was a struggle for them. For my mum, it's also, look, I fought 30 years for female liberation. That was a real key thing for her. Um, you have done, in 1970, my mother was the main breadwinner, the main earner in our household. But she wanted to buy a sofa, um, a sofa and my father had to sign the papers. So this is the 1970s in England. There was, you know, she had fought so hard to be, um, to, to take her position as a woman in a, an incredibly male-dominated society. And so she th I think she thought I was going backwards. And when I could articulate to her, look, this is a source of liberation for me because I don't want people to judge me on how I look. I don't want people to judge me according to, to, to beauty standards. I want people to listen to what I have to say. I've got a lot to say um, about the world. And once she could understand that, then she was with me all of the way. And she was fantastic. I mean, she was just absolutely amazing. And people would, she would listen patiently to people being incredibly Islamophobic and anti-Muslim. And she would just listen and let them get it all out. And then she'd say, well, actually, my daughter's a Muslim and you're wrong. Um, and she was fantastic like that. Absolutely fantastic. It was hard. When it comes to representation of women, Muslim women, 
in sport. And I suppose some women may not feel comfortable going to certain football games, but you went to the World Cup here and you had a great experience. So can you talk us through that? So I absolutely love sport. I love particularly football. Um, I'm absolutely hopeless at sport, but I love to watch it. My love of football began in 1978 in the World Cup when Argentina won. And it was this vivid, colourful, wonderful display that I watched on my on my television. I was you know, seven years old and the ticker tape was being thrown when they won the semi-final. And I really, really wanted you know, Argentina to win. And it was this real moment for me, a core memory. But look, I'm not going to go to a game in England. I don't feel that that is a place for me, sadly. Um, I live near Wembley, um, you know, the the national stadium in 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 the UK. And occasionally there's like a big game when it was the Euros and England was, you know, against Italy in the final you go. And there's there's alcohol everywhere. I'm a Muslim woman. I just don't feel comfortable with that. But also there's also the racism and getting called uh, names which are just uncomfortable. What does the mainstream media need to understand about the representation of Muslim women? Newsrooms need to be diverse. Right. They need multidisciplinary teams is a really important factor in any organization, whatever it is. And in the media, bring on different people, bring on different voices, get that nuance. We don't need a, a, a sort of single homogenous version of anything. Recognize the diversity of the human experience. There's a fantastic verse in the Quran that relates to if God had wanted to create you all the same, he would have. You know, it's created us diverse really appreciate that, the, the beauty of that. Um, the newsroom, we need, we need to make sure that Muslim women, Muslim men have the opportunity to, to get in at the ground floor, to do the internships, to learn the skills, to build the skills. How we do that, I think we need to make sure that we have our own media telling our own stories that gives that experience. We need to make sure that there are programs to get people into the, the mainstream companies. We need, you know, to make sure internally as a, as a community that we see media as a job, um, as something viable. Um, and I think certainly in as Muslims living in the West, there is that kind of immigrant experience where you just want your kid to have stability. Yeah. You know, you need them to be doctors, you need to lawyers engineers, and, lawyers, yeah. because you just need them to be stable because it's too unstable. We're, we're changing from that. I think the, the next generation in the UK, certainly, I think in America as well, is changing. But it's still an issue that to allow our kids, this is a proper career that's actually they're going to be safe in. It, it, and then the, the mainstream needs to make sure that it feels safe. Sarah, do you realise how much of an inspiration you are to a lot of women out there? That's enough. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think about it, do you? It's, at the end... Excuse me. It's okay. Look, our time, our time on this earth is really short, right? This is a transient world. We're here and then we're gone. And as a Muslim, and that is my core, I think you've got to get that across that this is an essence of me. It's like, it's like breathing. Um, I can't be anything else. And, oh, wow, that sense that this transient world, you've got to just do whatever good you can. And then we return, we go back home. And that's such a, a core sense of me. And if whatever good I do, if there is an atom's weight of good, I hope that it counts for me. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us on Centre Stage. I've really enjoyed this chat. We could definitely go on <laughs> a lot longer, but I appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Samantha.